Hey, welcome back, everybody, to the Financial Advisors Workshop. This is the show where we talk to financial advisors all across America and uh, talk to them about how they run their practice and their background so we get a sense of how they built it. And uh, we usually find some really interesting people. And today uh, we have Darby Eiffel. And Darby is now in Colorado, but she's got a storied history. And uh, Darby, welcome to the Financial Advisors Workshop. Thank you for having me, Brian. Excellent. Well, we had a really interesting discussion early on. <clears throat> so right now, Darby, you you own a, a practice and you're in Colorado right now. Tell us about your practice first, and then let's talk about your background that led into that. Yeah. Well, I just did move back to Colorado. I, uh, I, I, was, I was born here and went to Colorado State uh, veter- Vet School. I'm a veterinarian. And out of school, I moved up to Seattle, Washington. So I was up there for 30 years and just moved back. I have aging parents. So I came back to Colorado, but it's very virtual. And um, the story is uh, why. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Sure. So so a big part of your success has a lot to do with the vet business. And Very the- much. Yeah. I have a, um, a an incredibly... Um, niche practice. I have clients who are not veterinarians because of something else I kind of did up in Washington, which I really loved, but it's predominantly veterinarians. Great. So then uh, how did you, um, oh, so your practice is now clients all over the country, I understand, and mm-hmm. and like assets and how many families and tell us about like all the statistics about your practice. Yeah, you know, I should probably know how many assets under management. It's actually smaller than what it should be. And there's a reason why. So I'm kind of working on building that side of my practice. But the bottom line is when I started, I I I was trying to figure out how I would get in front of clients with my being a veterinarian and a retired veterinarian. And I thought I could teach at the vet schools. So I made some really good friends and professors and then I started a program where I would sit one-on-one with all any veterinarian graduating, right around graduation, build them a complimentary little mini mini financial plan. We're talking, you know, rudimentary, like here, you know, you need to pay your credit cards off first and you can't divide your gross income by 12. You need, there's this thing called tax. And so I would help them figure out take home and retirement plan and when they should jump into that and building emergencies are sort of one-on-one and, but they all come out with a lot of debt. So I was, and then I would sell them disability. I'm very fiercely product neutral and we have a really un- amazing disability division where we, you know, we have a guy that heads up that division that helps us figure out an amazing disability product. So I would set them up with good income protection and then they would matriculate into their careers and, circle back and become clients and, you know, other, you know, asset clients and planning clients. And so that I have clients all over the United States. And that came primarily because of your reach. How did you get such a reach around the whole country? How did you get known in events? Yeah, it's really just um, probably two pronged teaching. I, I teach at um, a, a, veterinary school in Washington, one in California and one in Georgia. And I've been asked to teach at other schools, but there's just not enough time in the day. Um, And then, you know, those students graduate and move all over the place, you know, so somebody might say, Hey, I, I met you at graduation. Um, I now live in Oklahoma and I'm married and we have a dual income and we, we don't know what to do with all this money we're making and, you know, so, so on and so forth. And then I also, I did a lot of, I, I published a lot of articles in veterinary journals. I wrote a lot. I've kind of simmered down doing that, but I could pick it back up. Just I'm busy. And then I did a lot of speaking at veterinary conventions. So, you know, I'd fly into Las Vegas and speak at a, you know, big, huge vet conference and people from all over the United States were there. And so it, it really just sort of, it's busy. I hold a lot of licenses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then the vets would see your see your presentations at the conferences or read your articles, and then they would call you because they knew that you knew their story. Right. Wow. So are there different things that you do with vets that you might do with a vet client? Yeah. I mean, I think that the largest 
sort of two uh, two things vet veterinarians and and medical dental students they come out with a lot of debt and i think that that's the biggest challenge for the dvm is that um and and it's changed and i can explain why but you know when i first started meeting with them their debt to income ratio is 2 to 1 so they might come out with you know 150,000 of debt and their incomes were starting around 70 75,000 and that was really scary. And I, and, you know, it was difficult for them to pay their debt off and juggle life. And so that's unique to veterinarians. These days, vet school costs have gone up, but also so have salaries. And they've gone up precipitously. I mean, the average veterinarian graduating now depends on where they're going to go practice. But now they're seeing, I'm seeing salary, base salaries of, say, you know, 120 thousand dollars and you know debt maybe 150 to 450 depends on where they went to school and but they're also earning production and so you know I have a lot of clients these days now making 180 200 250 some up in the threes if they're ER doctors um which is a uh, something that's sort of emerged over the last decade so it's that's challenging then when you get into practice ownership, that is a very, very complicated business. There's revenue streams from so many different, you know, you got labs, you have surgeries, you have, you know, um, diet, you have, you know, parasitic control, you've got all kinds of different income streams in a veterinary practice and very, very complicated business to run. And so the challenge with those clients is they don't necessarily understand how their practices work from a management perspective. They make bad business decisions. They don't get that education in school. And so it's challenging. Um, and so that then means I'm doing a lot of work looking at p and and balance sheets and looking at their metrics and saying, hey, you know, your cost of goods is too high or your um, you know, you, you might have some embezzlement going on or, you know, what, why aren't, you know, your, your compliance, your recommendations are not consistent. So I'm also doing business planning and trying to integrate that with personal planning. And it's unique because veterinarians often rely on the value of their practice to support their retirement when we should be diversifying and having them save more into a you know a retirement plan. So I can go on and on, but the point is is veterinary financial advising is very complicated. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it sounds like though you found a way to um, bring your knowledge of the veterinary business and to really help these folks in a very impactful way. Yeah. And, you know, along the way, I, I um, met someone on the internet. He happened to be a veterinarian and he owned a practice at the time. So then, you know, I became a practice owner uh, by marriage and we built a veterinary hospital. I was, there was another leg to my story, but, um, you know, so I was a peripheral practice owner as well. And so I've kind of lived through it all and done it all. So I, I live, eat, breathe that med, let's say. <laughs> hey, very good. Very good. So um, you also, for a period of time, uh, left the vet business when you were young and did something really extraordinary. And uh, I'm going to hear a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah. And I actually never really left the vet business. So what, what happened was when I got out of vet school, I've always been very entrepreneurial. Um, in vet school, I invented a radiology device and got a patent on that. And then I got flicked away by some big radiology company, but it put me through vet school. So when I got out back then, it was very difficult to find a veterinary position. I was in the 90s and it's very different today. Uh, practices are desperate for doctors, but I decided I felt like moving to Seattle. I think I saw a movie and thought it looked cool up there. So wanted something different from Colorado. So I moved up there and I got the one job that was offered to me. There were only three positions in the whole area. And my boss was horrible. He was horrible. I'm, I'm very healthy. He would walk around the practice with a cigarette sticking out of his mouth. And then if an animal would bite or scratch him in the back, he'd beat on him. I really, really hated my job. 
And meanwhile, I bought a fixer upper and I didn't have any money to pay for subcontractors. And, but one day I was looking at the house and I thought, you know, the bones and the framing and the electrical and the nervous system and the digestive and plumbing and skin and drywall, I thought I could fix this. So I went to the tool rental store and I met someone that I started dating and he showed me how to use tools. And I ended up learning how to fix and flip homes. And so I quit the evil job and I became what's, what's called a relief vet. So I would fill in for practices like a really like a substitute teacher. Right. So I did that and I would fix and flip homes. <clears throat> and on the third one, I thought I was 27 and I thought, well, I'm going to become a general contractor. And, and I, I had no idea how to do that. So I went and got my licenses and, and I built, um, I think I was the fifth biggest in city builder in Seattle and I was the first female. <laughs> that was a difficult uh, industry to break into. <laughs> yes. So, so I built homes. I built about a hundred homes um, over about 12 years in the Seattle area. And then the home business business fell apart and, and your fortunes waned as a result of that. Like everyone. <laughs> they, they evaporated. I had, um, I think I was worth about 14 million at the time. And I had 28 homes under construction when it melted down. And, I realized that I wasn't paying attention. You know, I just had my head down and I was doing side surgery and building homes. And I thought, oh, nothing bad can happen. And I was financial news and it just wasn't on my radar. So that was my mistake. I put all my eggs in one basket, the real estate basket. And, you know, I like to be my word. So I spent three years liquidating and selling all the, the, I finished all the spec homes because I wanted to pay all my subcontractors. So I continued to draw on all my loans. And I think I owed $13.8 million and then nothing was selling. So it took three years and I sold them for pennies on the dollar. And I sold the 27th home um, three years later, paid my final bank loan off, perfect credit, um, just, liquidated everything in my life. So I can't, I, you know, I went from a net worth of 14 million down to pretty much nothing. I had one town home left at the end. Oh, and that's really when I sat down and meanwhile, got married to the horse vet and he dragged me kicking and screaming out of the city down to this tiny town. And, um, his wife had died. And so I, I was, I adopted his kids and I was raising them and I built us a vet hospital, a big, beautiful building down there, but then I had nothing to do. And that's really how I got into this industry because I thought, you know what? I love, love business and financial topics and my colleagues don't, how, how could I serve my colleagues again, but in a way that, um, you know, that's unique. So here I am. <laughs> so, the, so the, so the real estate business kind of spurred you on, uh, to, uh, kind of get knowledgeable about financial issues. And then you used your vet knowledge. Uh, to kind of build a practice around that, which is interesting. Right. right. For you. And, yeah. And, you know, I know a thing or two about being in debt. So that's why my assets under management are not quite where they should be, um, given my tenure in the industry, because I work with a lot of negative net worth clients and they're servicing student debt um, rather than building assets. But again, incomes have really gone up. Um, there are debt forgiveness programs, public, um, you know, the federal government says they're going to forgive a lot of debt and we own tax on what's forgiven, but I spent a lot of time mapping clients towards that tax bomb, mm -hmm. I call it, um, and debt forgiveness. And so the assets are starting to come and now I'm working with a lot of practice owners who are exiting and, and I, I really love retirement income planning. So I went and got that designation and now I work with, you know, pre and, and post retirees. Excellent. So you're making a difference. You really are. I mean, I, I hope so. You know, that's my hope. I, I do give away a lot of free advice. Um, I mean, I'm a veterinarian. I want to help all the kittens. Right. So, um, I see new grads, you know, it's to me, it's like watching a, a puppy run out into traffic. It's just yikes. So, I give away about 600 hours a year of pro bono advice. I'm exhausted. I'm looking for help. It's hard to find another veterinarian who wants to be an advisor. <laughs> for unique <laughs> that they generally gravitate towards. Um, but 
you know, it, it's a program that I'm proud of that I do at these vet schools. I do it every year and get people started in the right direction. And, you know, I believe in the laws of reciprocity. Yes. Yes. Well, that's great. Well, so, so, but you, you built a very tight niche. So whatever you have is very tight because they know, they know you, they know your business. So this is really a triumph of niche marketing. Yeah. And I think that, I think it is. And, and I think even if you're obviously, you know, your listeners may not be veterinarians, but I think regardless, if you're, if you're passionate about something and you come from a place of truly giving, and I think that's the key to becoming a successful advisor is genuine um, desire to help and change and help others succeed. And I think that my purpose on this earth is to help other people succeed. I, I actually don't count my compensation. It just sort of shows up. I probably should, but I don't count my chickens. I never think about what I'm going to make when I'm working with someone. I put my head down and turn in the paperwork and um, I really want people to succeed. And I just believe that, you know, like the sun comes up every day, we don't have a doubt. I will be successful um, just because I'm doing good in the world. That's great. That's great. So, um, so the vets carry a lot of debt. Are there any other, you know, it's from school, those veterinary schools gotten very expensive. Um, are there any other interesting characteristics about vet business that you bring to the financial services business? Yeah, we touched on it, but veterinarians are very kind. Um, they're, even when they're highly successful, they don't get that I have arrived syndrome very often. They're just kind hearted people and it should make sense. Right. And so I really love working with veterinarians. They're just, um, they're good. And the other thing is, is again, they're naive. And I run across so many who are taken advantage of and they don't understand. And there's a lot of people out there that will stop at nothing to sell something to some, uh, a naive client and step on their back to get where they're going. I'm very protective of my clients. Um, and, you know, there's other, you know, not just the financial industry, but there's consultants and that'll charge $90,000 and say, here, raise your prices. And that just drives me berserk. So I think that working with them means being vigilant on their behalf. They're very busy, particularly practice owners. They're wearing so many different hats and they're other directed and you add kids into the mix and their lives are scattered and chaotic and they're trying to give to the world. So I spend a lot of time looking at their books, looking at their metrics, trying to, and I've really gotten to know the business. And I think that might be a key for an advisor is if you're working with business owners, um, find a niche, find a business that matters to you and, and really understand that business so that you can, you know, I don't hold myself out as a veterinary consultant. I'm not allowed. I have the securities license and it's out of my wheelhouse, but I know how to do it. Right. So behind the scenes, I'm looking at books and I'm making sure and looking out for them. So that's unique to veterinarians, I think, or maybe any business owner if they don't understand their business. Yeah. No, it sounds like, it sounds like uh, um, you've got a great sense of, of working with people. And you think, do you think vets are, just really kind people because they work with pets. Yeah. I mean, I think that if, you know, if you look at the numbers, becoming an MD or a dentist, maybe dentists would fall in line with veterinarians as far as income and debt, but vets generally don't go into the business for the money because we don't, we have pet insurance now, but it's not like human medical insurance. And so Vet school is harder to get into and harder to get through than medical school. That's a fact. And I mean, think about it. We've got pigs and goats and cows and sheep and cats and dogs. And a cat is not a mini dog. And they all have different disease processes and anatomy and physiology. And you have to keep track of it all. And it's very, very complicated. 
Um, but we don't make as much money as MDs. Like, I don't know any vets making a million dollars a year like an anesthesiologist might. Right. And so I think that they don't go into the industry for the money. They go into it because they they genuinely care about animals. And I'm not saying MDs don't, but you see where I'm going. It's really not about the money. Yeah. So I think that that just naturally draws kind hearted people. Yeah. Well, and then, but now you can steer them in the right direction. If they're not focused on, on money, at least from the protective side, that's your job now. Right. Yeah. I mean, quite frankly, they're afraid of money and they're afraid and they don't know what to do and they get it, uh, you know, paralysis by analysis. And so, you know, I, I always tell my clients, look, I'm not calling you a sick dog, but I make so many veterinary analogies to help them understand that what I do is very, very similar to what they do. I yeah. mean, and, and I think analogies, by the way, in this industry is, are super helpful. Um, most people have enough awareness about their own, you know, their own medical um, health. And so what I say to them is, look, when you put a, a complicated diagnostic plan together, you know, you've got, you've got a dog that walks in with a myriad of symptoms and you're asking the owner lots and lots and lots of questions and you're observing and then you're doing x-rays and um, imaging and blood tests and lab tests and chem panels and you send off a tube of blood and what comes back is a bunch of numbers and you know how to read the numbers. That's no different from your balance sheet or your profit and loss. Mm -hmm. And so you just need to understand those numbers. And then you assemble all the information that you've gathered and you put together a treatment plan. And that's not any different from a financial plan. Mm -hmm. And then from that, you're going to recommend services and products. I mean, if the dog is fat, you're going to be recommending satiety diet. Or, you know, if the dog has an infection, you're going to pick an antibiotic and you're going to pick one off the shelf that's appropriate. Um, And I do the same thing. Everything in the financial industry is a product. A mutual fund is a product. Mm -hmm. And so insurance Mm -hmm. products were were neutral. We're very fiercely product neutral. I don't work for anyone carrier, nor would I ever. And so just like you, I'm going to pick products off the shelf to accomplish what I'm trying to achieve. And I think those analogies help people. I only had one veterinarian in all my years say she was offended by that. (laughs) Everybody else appreciates the education. (laughs) So vets and, and, and medical folks in general, they come, yeah, you know, they do an analysis, come up with a prescription. And isn't that a little bit like financial advisors, right? Yeah. I mean, if I want to move a portfolio because it's poorly positioned or not growing, or they are not hearing from the advisor, that's really not any different from doing a knee surgery. Like here, the knee is broken. Let's fix it. So I think that analogies, no matter what the industry um, try to, and that's why I mentioned earlier, like if you, you know, if you're an advisor and you're looking at finding a niche, Find something you know, or if you're working with a business owner or some, you know, I don't know, a ballerina, find something in that niche that they can relate to. Because I think a lot of advisors spend too much time trying to sound real smart. And that's really not what clients are looking for. They're looking for understanding. So I use a lot of analogies. (laughs) Yeah. Nice. Nice. Very kind. Well, great. Well, good. Uh, this has been a great discussion. You have a great practice, and uh, it's it's an interesting to hear how it's all evolved. And you've had some successes and some failures that have also taught you things to be a better advisor as well. Yeah, I mean, I I can go through all kinds of mistakes I've made, and you know, every day is a learning experience. But I think my biggest mistake was that I. I kept hanging on to, you know, sort of these smaller clients. Um, to this day, I'll help anyone who reaches out to me. And I don't have like a asset threshold. I have a different criteria of who I would like to work with. I only have two criteria. They need to be nice and they need to be engaged. And that's my criteria. But as a result, I do have very small clients and maybe I've only sold them a disability or a term life insurance policy to protect their new family. But, um, I just think that, you know, everybody needs help. So I, I look for an advisor that I think would be a good fit for the team that might want to jump into the veterinary niche. I've got plenty of clients to hand them. Um, 
So I think that's a mistake is kind of hanging on too long and, and not help, help finding, you know, the right fit. Um, but also I think that can create a small client mindset. And so I actually have worked hard to think, you know, I'm, I'm really good at this. I can work with higher net worth clients and not being intimidated by that. Good. Good. Well, it sounds like you have a good plan and, and then, you know, we all make mistakes along the way and then you learn from those mistakes and you're, you're always constantly revising and, and, uh, you know, repositioning to make it better and grow. And it's, uh, it sounds like a great, just a great approach. Um, so if you were to share with our advisor community, you know, just the general thoughts on how you succeeded and, and what you could share with them about success, what, what would they be? I think really what I mentioned before is just one big piece of it. And that is if you truly come from a genuine place of wanting to help, that would be the number one reason I'm successful because clients can detect that. If you're coming from a place of wanting to sell and how much can I make off this person, that I just don't think that that's going to um, drive success or at least um, success you can be proud of, right? Yeah. Then the, the second piece is your team. And you know, I've sure had team members that needed to go and weren't, you know, I mean, I like to say, hey, look, this bus is going to Chicago and it seems like you're going to San Francisco. So you can either go to Chicago with us and um, or let's pull the bus over and get you on the right bus. So I think that the key is finding team members that are engaged and along your mission and have the same mindset of client service and helping others succeed. And I couldn't have done this without my team. And that's another key piece to success is um, also really supporting and believing in your team and educating them so they don't just feel like they're churning out paperwork and they don't have an understanding of what they're doing. So I really spend a lot of time teaching my team, here's why we're doing this. Right. And I think they appreciate that. Yes. And relying on the team and having a great team to support the growth, which is fun. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Well, good. Well, thank you. This has been a great discussion. We learned a lot about the vet business and, uh, and, and your successes and, and failures that led to successes. And that's really, uh, it's great. I mean, you're a great example of how people turn their life story into a great financial practice, financial advisor, and people need that help and you're there to help them. So congratulations, Darby, on building a great practice. And we'll look forward to hearing more from you over, the, over time in the future. Thank you so much for having me. I wish Absolutely. everybody success out there. Thanks, Darby, appreciate that. And, and uh, thanks everybody for being with us today in the Financial Advisors Workshop. I think we're gonna leave it there. And we're going to come back with another really interesting interview. Every everyone we do is very unique. This was a very unique one. Darby, thank you. And uh, we'll be back again very soon, everybody. Uh, so Financial Advisors Workshop is over and out for today. Thanks, everyone, for being with us.